15,000 wins earlier this year, big accomplishment. When did you start thinking about it? You know, I really didn't pay much attention to the numbers till Roger started giving me his countdown. And I guess when I got within uh, 10 or 15, I started paying attention, you know, looking at the previous days and the upcoming cards to see when it might happen. Compare the Dave Pallone that won that first race as a driver, or even race number 1,000, to the driver that won race 15,000. Well, you know, I'd like to say I'm a whole lot different and seasoned and all that, but uh, as my wife can vouch for me, I was very nervous, especially when I found out Hervé was going to be there and uh, the media and, and management and my family. So uh, I was like a, a kid out there, I, as excited I, as I was when I had my first driving card. So it wasn't as, uh, you know, laid back as I usually am. What about you as a person? How much have you changed over the years from the time you started driving? Intensity-wise, I don't think I've backed off at all, uh, which you know works for you and against you. I, I guess I've gotten a little better at turning the page, but uh, still as intense as ever when I'm on the racetrack. Uh, the kids and the family have made things a lot easier to come home to You know, on those bad nights when you don't do as good uh, and you see them and, and go outside and have fun or go up and play with the horses or whatever. But uh, you know, very still intense on the racetrack, but maybe mellowed a little bit with age. Let's talk a little bit about some of your, your idols, your driving heroes growing up. I mean, obviously, Hervé was there for the 15,000th. You, you know, I know you looked up to him, but who else did you really look up to over the years? You know, probably the first adios I was ever at uh, was Joe O'Brien and Armbro Ranger beating Stanley Dancer and Keystone Orr. And I think I was 13 years old, and obviously in that day, those guys were, uh, you know, at the pinnacle of their careers, along with maybe Billy Houghton. And from there I went on uh, locally. When I first got my license, I raced against uh, Bill Fay and, and Bill Zent, my father-in-law, and uh, Dick Stillings. And you know, I still respect those guys a ton as horsemen. So I had a lot of good role models to grow up with here at the Meadows. And I think the thing that really helped my career was when I was uh, oh, in my early 20s, I took a stable to the Meadowlands and I uh, was able to use John Campbell and Bill O'Donnell and, uh, you know, get to see some of the things they did and, uh, you know, just learn from the best in the business. But probably the biggest break I ever got was, was when I got back to the Meadows and decided I wanted to be a driver as opposed to a trainer. And uh, Mark Goldberg was using me on his horses. And um, I don't think anybody analyzes a race or can help you as much with a race as Mark has over the years. And, I owe a lot to him with the way he uh, tutored me. You know, you could race a horse and maybe win the race and be patting yourself on the back and come back and Mark would critique, critique your drive. And then the very next race, you could finish fourth and he'd tell you what a great job you did. So, you know, he was the, the, the consummate, tick, I guess, uh, coach. He was like a quarterback coach to me. You mentioned the time you went to the Meadowlands. Some people say, oh, you should have stuck it out or some say it's a great move that you came back. What are your thoughts now looking back after all these years? Oh, I wouldn't trade anything for the way it is right now, you know. So I, in my mind, it was the greatest thing that ever happened coming back here. Um, I got a good dose of, of, you know, top shelf racing with the, the elite guys up there. But I really wanted to drive horses and I wanted to drive a lot of horses. And the opportunity wasn't there at 20 years old to race horses at the Meadowlands. So I had to come back and establish myself. And, uh, uh, I, you know, what am I going to knock? Everything's been great. This is home. Uh, i got a beautiful family. I live four miles from the track. Uh, wouldn't change a thing. You talked about training. Do you miss that part of the business? Obviously, your time's limited now, but do you miss training? I really do. You know, me and Beth Ann have talked about whenever I'm wind it down driving, maybe getting a few horses and piddling around like Billy and Mario Faye have done. Uh, even this morning before qualifiers, I went in and trained a horse for my brother. So, you know, if Ronnie Burke or someone has a young horse they want me to sit behind, I really do enjoy getting in there and, and uh, getting my hands dirty still. Talk about how tough it is to live this life and yet have a family. Well, it's testing in the summer. Uh, you know, you're on the road quite a bit and uh, back and forth and it's really not fair to the girls, but uh, it's part of the game, and thank goodness Beth Ann has a horse background where, you know, she knows the ins and outs and, and what's going to go on. But uh, as they get older, you know, they're going to be able to travel with us more, and, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to this year with Sweet Lou and having them on board. And, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of work in the summer, and I'm glad every year when it's over with, but I'm chomping at the bit to get to the stake races right now. 
What about the technology in the sport as far as the race bikes? Everything seems to have changed since you started driving. How much of it is technology and how much of it is that the horse has changed? Well, I think it's a lot. I think, you know, the breed is refined now and they're such naturals that, you know, it used to be you'd have to break a horse to the pace and now they're just naturally gated in, in the equipment that we rigged them and the way we race them and the style we train them down. Uh, these race bikes, I couldn't imagine back in the day when I raced Arts Place and, and Pandorosas and them, if they were hooked to a spider or a UFO race bike, how fast they would have gone in the style that we race them now. Uh, it's incredible, the technology out there. So is it really that the, the horses are faster or is it the technology? I mean, you know, how do you compare a Sweet Lou to an Arts Place or something along those lines? You know, it, it's near impossible to compare, and I don't put a lot of, you know, faith in times and how much times used to be, because I used to be a 54 pacer, was incredible. I know when I went with Arch Place as a two-year-old in 55, it was by far the best mile I'd ever been with a young horse. So, you know, you go back and you kick around Sweet Lou now in 49, and, you know, that's what I'm so excited about him for. Uh, he reminds me of Art. He's got that laid-back attitude, uh, flawless gated. You know, loves to do his work, and um, it's like he's got three lungs. What are some of your most memorable moments in the sport? Uh, you know, I, I, in, in order, if I had to start them off, in, if I had to start them in order, you know, the adios meant a lot to me winning here, especially being a long shot, not expecting it that day. With Washington, V.C., if I had to rate them, I'd still probably have to go Little Brown Jug with P47 and, uh, you know, that David Glass story that day where he beat the three-horse pelling entry of rock and roll. You know, it was a big day that day. Um, this Breeders' Crown this year when we were able to get a couple Breeders' Crown winners with uh, Uncle Peter and, and Sweet Lou. So we've got some highlight films out there. <laughs> Dave, kind of a necessary evil in the sport is, or for your perspective, I would think, is the tote board. Uh, you know, you've got that board lit up right there showing you what other people think you need to do as far as how you drive a horse. I'm sure that's changed a little bit over the years for you as far as your reaction. You've been cheered by fans. You've been booed by fans, I'm sure, more than enough times. As, you, as the leading driver at a racetrack, that's going to happen. You're going to hear the people that, that didn't think you drove a horse well because, frankly, they may have overbet you. Uh, how does the tote board affect you in a race? Well, yeah, a lot of times, Jeff, I just throw it right out the window. You know, I, I, I've got a pretty good beat on the horses and the caliber of horse that I'm racing. Uh, huge advantage that I get to race a lot of the good horses at the Meadows. But uh, also a huge advantage that, uh, that I've sat behind most of them, and I know their tendencies. So I really don't pay as much attention to the tote board as I do, you know, maybe a trainer change or a drop down or something like that. But uh, I've got a pretty good bead when I go behind the gate who I've got to beat, and I'm not really that influenced by the board. So how thick has your skin gotten over the years? It's pretty thick. You know, I miss the days when uh, there were people out there yelling at us, if you want to know the truth. It's, it's kind of nice to get rail birded once in a while. A lot of times you get named on three, four, five horses in one race. How do you make that decision? Do you always end up taking what you think is the best horse? And how tough for you is it to tell people no, that you can't drive their horse? Well, you know, it's the one tough thing every morning. I'm going to, you know, wake up and piss somebody off with able to, you know, only race one horse in a race. But uh, I, I do quite a bit of homework. I do give preference to my top accounts. Uh, you know, Ronnie Burke and uh, the Weaver Brashemis get uh, probably pretty much first call on everything. But, uh, you know, I, I do my homework with Pathway and watch replays and stuff like that. And like I said, I've got a good beat of most of the horses down there. So, you know, I do my share of handicapping too. Is it also tough that family members, sometimes your own brother or your in-laws, well, you have to call off their horses too? Well, those are the calls that Beth Ann has to make. I, uh, I don't deal with that, with the gloom and doom too good. So uh, they usually know if they haven't heard from me by 9 o'clock that it's not going to be good news and uh, she gets to be the Grim Reaper. Dave, back in the 90s, we had David Miller and Brian Sears racing here against you at the Meadows on a nightly basis. Compare those days against the driving colony that we have now. We have by far the strongest driving colony I've ever faced. You know, it was, uh, it was deep back then with Brian and David and, you know, and Dickie and Doug racing a lot of horses back then, but uh, it's, you can go seven or eight deep now and you're gonna get a more than capable guy. Um, like I said, I, I'm proud of the fact that, that I have raced against, you know, Brian, uh, David, Georgie, 
a lot of the guys from out of town and, and stood up pretty well against them. But um, I'm especially proud because I know how good this group is here right now. And uh, it, it's tougher and tougher to win races. And it's, a, uh, like I said, a very deep colony. Records are made to be broken, Dave. Who do you see driving now that will join that 15,000 win club? And after you've retired, who could pass you up? Wow, you know, knock on wood, they can stay healthy as I've been throughout my career. Uh, Timmy's got a great work ethic. Uh, the young guys up in Canada, uh, Scotty Zeron and, and the McNair kid and uh, now Billy Davis, those three guys have a world of talent. Matty Kakeli here at Pocono, uh, he's got a good head on his shoulders and a nice kid with talent. Um, those would be my front runners, but you have to be so lucky and you have to stay healthy and you have to continue to get live drive. Speaking of staying healthy, what do you do? What's the secret to staying healthy? This isn't something that just anybody can go out there and do, and you've been doing it for a long time. What does it take to stay in shape? You know, I had my bad accident, and, um, and Beth Ann rehabbed me back from that, and uh, she made it a point that, you know, you're going to have to get yourself stronger, and, uh, you know, you're not getting any younger. You're going to have to work out. So, you know... She's forced me to go to the gym, forced me to personal train, you know, the things that I hate, I hate going to the gym, but uh, it's made a huge difference. Uh, I feel like at 50, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, at least I felt like I was in pretty good shape until the other day when I tried to stand up on the bike. But, uh, you know, I, I think I'm probably the best physical shape of my life right now at 50. I guess chasing around a couple of little kids doesn't hurt either. That's going to keep me young for quite a while yet. Um, yeah, I have been um, riding horses since I've been about four years old in doing competitive riding. Started out showing um, performance, English, Western, and I switched to barrel racing when I was 16. Um, I've barrel raced all over the United States when I was in high school, and I continue to barrel race to this day. With the help of him, he helps me. I I'm just groom. stay. He's my groom. I stay within local area, but I have uh, four horses and um, two that I'm currently running, and the girls have a pony, and he helps me with the barn work. He's kind of my farm maintenance <laughs> man. If I need my manure spreader fixed or my four-wheeler fixed or something like that, he'll drag my arena or set up my barrels, things like that. Like, that helps to keep you grounded a little bit, I guess, Dave. Yeah, she always seems to want to run on golf days, you know? <laughs> it's, it's a tough lifestyle. Not only for the safety of him, but also when he is um, away a lot of times in the evenings and weekends and things like that. And I'm at home with the kids and, you know, we don't get to sit down and have your typical family dinner at 5.30, 6 o'clock. So it's a little bit different of a lifestyle. No weddings on Saturdays. And actually we got married on, on a Sunday. Sunday night because of all of our family and friends being able to make it to our wedding. Yes, once he... Um, had his accident, um, I kind of forced him into some rehab he wasn't happy with. Started making him swim and started slow like that. Then we went into the weights and then I told him that uh, he probably needed a personal trainer. So now he has been personal training for a couple years now. And we personal train together twice a week. And then he also does some running and some other cardio type things. Also have changed my style of cooking a lot <laughs> because... He likes to keep his weight at a certain weight, so we try to eat healthy and things like that.